Hi everyone, this is uh, Kofi CanCam. Um, welcome to the first uh, webinar on the Right Lincoln Expert Series done in conjunction with Beat the GMAT. We're really happy this year to be the first one uh, and also be talking about Harvard Business School. I know that Harvard Business School represents the dream school for a lot of you. Um, and you know, I want to talk to you about some of the things that are really important to getting into Harvard Business School, but also there'll be some general tips in there for all sort of top tier schools as well. All right, so you'll notice that all of you are on mute. It's not because I don't want to hear your beautiful voices. It's just because there'd be sort of a too much noise, too much sound um, if we turn everything on. But I will get to all questions. Um, please type your questions, and uh, Jennifer from Beat the GMAT will basically give them to me. There'll be plenty of time for questions on the back end, but if something's really pressing during the course of the presentation, please type it in, and I, I will break stride and try to answer it, okay? So I'm going to speak a little bit about our company, just so if you're comfortable that we know what we're talking about. And then we'll talk about HBS and a little bit about the HBS essays as well. So um, Admit Advantage basically is a company that helps people get into uh, business schools. And so business schools, law schools, uh, colleges, soon to be medical schools. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're really focused on helping candidates from inception all the way sort of to the end. And there are a couple of core tenets that underlie our company. One. Um, experience. All of us have graduated from top tier programs. We've all sort of, except for the founders, uh, in terms of having to go through the selection process, but everyone's been, you know, interviewed <laughs> ad nauseum, um, and most of us have served on admissions committees, either as second year interviewers, alumni interviewers, or people that actually work for admissions after we graduate from business school. We're also known to have, we hope, really good customer service, and so client alignment focus is really important to us. Um, we want our our clients feeling like we feel like they can tell us anything, and we spend a lot of time trying to sort of get to know them better. And the result is not only people get into really good schools, but you know, from our perspective, it makes it more fun because we get invited to going away parties, been invited to a couple of overseas weddings, gone to one of them, um, and you know, it, it just creates sort of a fun process. Just you know, applying to school is stressful enough, and a lot of times candidates. Um, try to regurgitate things that they think schools want to hear, and they miss so many great nuggets in their background, either from a personal or professional perspective, that don't make the cut. And so we spend a lot of time getting to know our clients, making them feel comfortable so that they can talk about these things that often become the kernels of really great essays and really great themes throughout their, their application. And the last point is performance, right? So all of this is a moot point. We're fun guys uh, and women, but we want our people getting into top tier schools. We've been lucky that they have. We've had really good clients. Uh, we think we've had, you know, somewhat of a role in helping people get into great schools. But you know, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. And so we've got a number of people at all these schools listed here, from Columbia to Harvard, to Cornell to Berkeley, um, INSEAD, LBS, Said, etc. So we're we're really pleased about that, and we we uh, we expect to have another good year uh, coming up this fall. So we'll see what happens. Uh, my name is Kofi. I think a lot of you know me from Beat the GMAT. I consider you guys my people. Um, I try to be on there every day. And uh, basically, I worked at Accenture. I worked at Nettophone, which was a predecessor to Skype. A little less successful, uh, not because of me, but uh, not fully because of me. Um, but that's sort of my my uh, my background, sort of in technology and education and entrepreneurship. Um, after business school at Wharton, I basically uh, started and sold a software company. I have served as a Warren and Harvard College interviewer. I did my undergraduate degree from Harvard in neurobiology. I stayed there and did a one-year program in the master's, uh, this grad school of education, pursued my master's of education. And then at Wharton, um, I ran uh, the largest student-run conference, uh, the Whitney Young Conference. I also served as a Wharton Fellow, which was great. I was very lucky. It was, uh, I think it was $20,000 a year, which at that point in time was a lot of money. And I was a teaching assistant for a first-year marketing course in my second year. Um, Eric Allen, very similar background, probably a little bit more impressive. We both worked at Accenture, just not in the same city. Eric worked at GE Capital for a while, actually after business school. He came into business school on the heels of selling a software company uh, that he started with his brother, who actually was a Wharton alum. And um, has served. he served as a Wharton and Brown uh, alumni interviewer. Um, at, he did his undergrad degree from Brown in engineering. Uh, did very well at Warren uh, educationally, was a Twigo Fellow, which was a full ride, and graduated with honors. So as mentioned, he did do a little bit better. Um, we've got a number of wonderful consultants, 
They come from a variety of really top tier backgrounds from companies like McKinsey and Google to the startup world, the UN, um, GE, Goldman, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see more of them um, on our website. Um, you can see how we were followed sort of the, the first rule of starting a good company, hire people that are smarter than you. I'd probably say, I'd say probably about 90% of the people in our company are smarter than us. The other 10% are probably going to fire. I'm kidding. But uh, we've had, we have done a pretty good job of finding really great people. Okay? So with that, I don't want to talk anything more about the company. Um, I'll give you a little bit in terms of some of the options to work with us in the back end, but I want to deep dive into the school. So, you know, it's funny. We talk about Harvard literally every day um, because it's one of the schools that people that do our free consultations want to talk about. And these are the things, you know, I ask them sort of why do you want to go to Harvard or, you know, what is it, what's motivating your interest? And beyond making, uh, you know, good coin or sort of being, uh, you know, well regarded or known by the grandmother as the Harvard graduate, um, people tend to say a couple of different things, right? So people want to go for the brand. It's got that kind of um, global brand entrepreneurship. There are obviously many great entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs uh, like the women from Guilt Group and, you know, older entrepreneurs like uh, the founder of Staples. Mitt Romney was one of the guys that found it. Um, it's obviously very global. You know, this is all the Harvard schools. I can tell you just from traveling my own, being a Harvard college grad, you know, there's no place in the world uh, you won't go where there won't be Harvard people who are pretty well positioned. Um, the business schools, no, no exception to that. Very diverse. And diversity in terms of ethnicity, diversity in terms of sexual orientation, diversity in terms of, you know, socioeconomic status, diversity in terms of what people have done before business school, from the private equity people to, you know, the, the women in the military, exceptionally diverse. Um, prestige, and that's kind of related to brand as well. Uh, the case method. So those of you who don't know what the case method is and are applying soon, you got to do your research. Basically, the case method um, is a sort of a, like a, a storied narrative um, that you essentially sort of follow business protagonists and help him or her make decisions. That's how Harvard uh, basically teaches all of their all of their work. So if you go to Harvard Business School, you'll go through about 580 to 600 cases in that two-year stint, and it sort of builds up pattern recognition, muscle memory, so to speak, et cetera, right? And leadership. So leadership is obviously a huge, huge piece of the school. Um, I remember going, my sister graduated in 10, and the dean at the time um, was speaking about how everyone there was going to be a leader, big L or little L, but leadership is super important. When you go to a school like Harvard Business School, people will expect you to be a leader, will expect you to have answers, and often you're thrust in that position, you know, <laughs> with or without your consent, that's kind of what happens. Okay? Now, by the numbers, it's interesting. I mean, you know, people, when I talk to candidates, you know, they often have very strong conceptions, not just about Harvard, but let's talk about Harvard specifically about sort of what people do when they get out or what people are doing coming in. The reality is most of you are very interested in a school like HBS because there's exceptional diversity all across the board, right? So we talked to Navy SEALs. It's one of their top tier schools. I talked to private equity people, one of their top tier schools. I talked to people, you know, coming from the Peace Corps, one of their top tier schools. And there's a reason for that. It's because there's an exceptional diversity in terms of the pre-MBA industry. So just sort of as a, as a caveat, no, not everyone's coming from consulting coming in. So, you know, we often get the questions, I don't work at Bain or, B, or BCG or McKinsey. Am I going to be a disadvantage? Well, only 20% of the people coming in work at those those kinds of companies, right? And you look at financial services, I would probably include venture capital with that. That's obviously, you know, 30%, but that's not the huge, that's not the majority of the class. If you took consulting and you took sort of finance, including VC and private equity, that's about 50% of the class, but you find a lot of people coming from communications, high tech, there's a pretty sizable military presence, nonprofits quite big, you know, energy is growing, that includes clean tech as well as sort of, um, you know, oil, gas. So there is a lot of diversity coming in, okay? Um, and that includes undergraduate majors. So what's interesting is that, um, you know, there are almost, I consider this near equivalency, uh, you know, 44 to 38%, you know, there are, it's almost nearly balanced between people that sort of had a hardcore business economics focus coming in and those people who are more so sort of STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math oriented, um, it's very strong. And frankly, I expect that's going to, to shift even more so um, as, you know, towards sort of STEM-oriented people, as, um, you know, more people want to come out 
and sort of go build things in the valley and not necessarily go work on the street, or Wall Street specifically. Okay, then you've got humanity social sciences, nearly 20%. So it's a, it's a large portion. We all know the class is, is, you know, is big at 932, but we also may not realize it's very diverse as well, as I've mentioned, right? So women are a big percentage, 41%. That has not always been the case, and it probably will get closer and closer to 50, I hope, um, over the course of the next five to seven years. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, people of color uh, from America there, as well as sort of internationally. It, the class is basically a third international. Um, you know, the average age is 27. Many countries are presented. And the GMAT range, well, it is quite wide, and there is probably one person or two that have a 550. You look at the median and even the mean, you're talking, you know, comfortably into the 700s. And it's interesting, you know, I am Wharton class of 04, and I will tell you that all these schools have begun an upward march um, in terms of the, the GMAT. So when I was applying to school, you know, back like 11, 12 years ago, you were looking at schools like Harvard, that, you know, the mean median was probably about 704 to 707. And now, you know, you've hung like 20 points on it. So 700 used to be the magic number. Um, I would say if you have a 700, 710, you're operating from a little bit of a deficit. And if you feel like you could get a 730, 740, you know, it probably be worth it for you to consider taking the GMAT again. But that's a question I'm sure that's going to come up, right? And then basically, I won't go through all this, but you'll see, you know, it is a big class. They do get a lot of um, a lot of uh, applicants, and so and you'll notice that Harvard's got one of the highest yield percentages. The yield being, you know, the number of students um, that actually decide to matriculate over the number of students accepted. And Harvard's is amongst, if not the highest in the industry, at close to ninety percent. Right. Let's talk a little bit about what they're looking for because I get this question all the time. Right. So leadership. Right. And leadership doesn't necessarily mean that you are, uh, you know, an associate overlooking all your analysts or you are, you know, a leader of sort of your battalion or your, you know, a, a team sort of, um, you know, professionally in sports, um, although there are people like that, obviously. Leadership um, can also mean leadership of tasks. And the reality is a lot of you are too young to have great leadership in your job, okay? Um, a lot of you are structured in jobs where it's very hierarchical. And so, as a 25, 26, even 27 year old, you're not going to have that many opportunities to have leadership, but they do want to see that. They do want to see that where you've gotten the opportunity, you've taken it. They do want to see that you've shown leadership potentially outside of work, and they are looking at the end of the day for impact. So if your resume reads like, um, if your resume reads as if you are, uh, you know, just listing a job description, and it's not reading as if, you know, you're really highlighting what you've done, what your legacy is at a particular institution, that's a problem. You have to show impact. Okay? They do want people that have high horsepower, right? So analytical aptitude and appetite is very, very important, right? And to a certain extent, your GPA and your GMAT are somewhat taken as proxies. But they also want to look for they're looking for people that have stretched themselves in their jobs, have taken sort of new assignments on, have this sort of unquenchable thirst for knowledge, right? And they do want people that are comfortable dealing with the ambiguity of real business. Right? So we've got a company here. And I can tell you that, you know, there's so many things that happen on a week-to-week -week basis where there's no clear-cut answer. We've got imperfect, imperfect information, incomplete information, and, you know, we need to make decisions. And it's not even clear on the back end that we made the right decision. We, only have, we have to devise ways to test that. That is what you're going to find in the case-oriented method, and they want people that can deal with that. So if you are someone that, you know, freaks out if you can't, if you're not told you have the right answer or doesn't know that they're, you know, freaks out if you don't have the tried and true established path to accomplish something, you are going to have trouble um, at HBS, and it may not be basically the best school for you, okay? Um, and if they notice that, you probably will not get accepted. And then they want people that can keep up. You're going to go to a school like HBS, and you're going to look around and say, how am I here, right? There's so many smart people, and everyone has that feeling. And, you know, you're not going to be able to sort of crawl into your shell. You will be cold called in class. It is all case based. This, you know, there is a discussion going on, so you need to be able to keep up. Uh, you need to, you know, not be intimidated. You need to allow the class to move on. They want people that can do that quite well. Okay, and then they want engagement. So community involvement. Community can be your academic community. You know, your undergraduate community can be your neighbor community. Can be your religious community. Community can be your physical, you know, home community. But they want to see that you're sort of taking your undergraduate leadership. You're taking your undergraduate training. You're taking your your 
your professional training and you're finding ways to sort of improve the community around you. Okay? They're looking for campus involvement. The best proxy for the business school environment, the best proxy for your life as a business school student is often really going to be your life as a college student. So, you know, I just spoke to someone the other day and, you know, they had not listed on their resume any of their college activities. And they said, well, you know, I graduated six years ago. And I said, well, I understand that, you know, if you're looking for a job, that stuff isn't relevant, what you did in college or key activities. But when you're applying to business school, that's super relevant. So keep that in mind as you look at your resumes, all right? And they also want people that can be a good teammate. So most people that go there have type A personalities. They want to win. They're used to being in charge, used to being successful. It's almost like being an athlete, a star athlete in college, and you're trying to go play in the NFL. Well, the NFL is filled with really great players. And you know, you're not necessarily going to get to the team and be the best player. You're going to have to sometimes just be on the team. You're going to have to take orders sometimes. You're going to have to, you know, go along with decisions. Maybe you vocally protest or give your advice, but a decision's made over your head, and you've got to sort of still contribute um, and, 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 and carry your weight. So they are looking for people like that as well. All right? That's a nutshell. Now, there's obviously more stuff, but that's sort of a, a, a topical overview of the kinds of things they're interested in. Let's take into the essay. So before I sort of jump to the essay, I sort of did this deliberately. When I was making these slides, I thought maybe I'll just put the question first. But the reason why I put this part first in terms of knowing what you're going to say is because I want you to focus on that prior to delving into the HBS essay or the Stanford essay or the Wharton essay, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to be comfortable with your narrative. You've got to understand, okay, what is your brand, right? What are sort of the... the even if it's not three to five, maybe it's it's ten. What are the leadership characteristics that that you want a reviewer to basically say about you? So think about it in this context. If you met an admissions officer and they really liked you, and you were competing for that last spot in HBS, and they have to stand up and defend you, how would you want them to describe you? And you've got to make sure that you basically are finding, you know, stories from a personal, professional, um, and community aspect that sort of that represent and sort of underscore those leadership characteristics. So things, leadership characteristics like being analytical, being a great communicator, being able to make decisions with limited information, you know, being civically or community minded, um, being innovative, being adaptive, um, being able to lead without without authority. Those kinds of things, you know, every business school wants, and frankly, every business wants. And so you're gonna your job is to sort of, you know, Whichever direction you want to go, and I kind of suggest to a certain extent you find sort of the stories, experiences, and accomplishments that really have shaped your life. Like if I interviewed your sister or your, your best friend, and I say, you know, what are the stories that have shaped, you know, Jim's life? It'd be a mixture of personal, professional, academic stories. Try to find those things and community stories as well. Try to find those those stories and then think, okay, what are the what are the leadership characteristics which sort of emanate or which 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 kind of you know come to the surface based on this specific thing happening in my life or, the, or me doing this specific thing. And like try to find those traits and try to make sure those traits line up with, you know, really good leadership traits, really you know, the kind of traits that people would want in a business school class and or in their company. Right? That's how you sort of build your brand and, and, and sort of and, and, and craft your story, quote unquote, which you hear a lot um, if you're sort of in the circuit, I suppose. You do want to differentiate a little bit, but you don't want to focus obsessively on differentiating. So, you know, we get calls all the time. People say, "Look at my resume. Tell me what's different. What am I going to write about?" Right? And that's not really how you want to do it. You do want to be authentic. You want to find things that sort of match your passion. All of you are going to school for a specific reason, and obviously, some of that is economic. You don't you don't go to school like Harvard um, without thinking a little bit about that, partially because it's so expensive, but also because you're going to get lots of opportunities to probably improve your lot financially. But that can't be the driving force, and it certainly can't be communicated as such. So, you know, what is your professional passion? What are your other passions? You know, what are the things that make you kind of interesting? You know, they want to see that, okay? And this is a, a really important. If you are applying from a, a place that feeds a lot of people in the business school, if you're coming from a Johnson Johnson, if you're coming from a Google, if you're coming from a bank, if you're coming from a consulting company, and you know you're looking to your left and your right. You've got peers that you've worked for the last two to three years that are applying to business school. All of you went to kind of similar type undergrads. This is the stuff that gets you in, right? Being true to yourself and your passion. This is the stuff that makes them feel like, oh, this is not just the same exact essay that I read, you know, um, 
uh, two, three days ago, right? Uh, is this guy John? Is this Jim or is this you know Stacy? It's kind of the same story. You don't want him saying that, but you don't want to force the issue. So make sure you're sort of you know going to the absolute core of of kind of your motivations, your drives, what you want to do with your life, um, you know what how you're looking to make your your mark. Make sure you're thinking about that stuff prior to starting your essays. Okay, and you know don't just rely on the numbers. The reality is that um, you know having a three eight uh, from Columbia or Princeton in a 760 GMAT doesn't guarantee you admission in a school like Harvard. All right? There literally are, you know, 70% of the people that apply to this school are qualified. And you're looking at, you know, 10 to 12% getting it. So just think about that for a second. Right? If you had um, 20 people, 20 random applicants to Harvard, if you took that out, six of them you could basically discard because they've got no chance of getting it. Bad GMAT, bad GPA poor work experience, probably at least two or three of those. Um, that leaves 14 that are really good, right? The professors would be delighted to have them in their class. Of that 14, two are getting in, right? Two. And so don't think that every year we talk to people who, you know, we have like this ding analysis package, and we talk to people like, I don't know, I didn't get in. I mean, you kind of talk to them a little bit, and you know, they're on the site initially, and kind of keep talking. And say, look, I can't believe I didn't get in. I can't believe I didn't get an interview. I got a three five. I I went to Duke, et cetera, et cetera. I had a seven thirty. How could I not get an interview? Right? Um, they're angry, but that's what it means. Okay? And you know, I, it's across the board at Harvard. So just 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 realize that that that's that's what it means. So you've got to sell the dream, paint a clear picture and indicate, you know, sort of what you've done historically, skill sets you've picked up, and then bridge a gap to the future. Now, I know a lot of you are saying, how do I do this in one essay? And it's really interesting because, you know, years ago, Harvard used to have six essays. And, you know, my friends were replying 10 years ago. They were like, oh, Harvard's got six essays, and they were so angry that they had to write all these essays. You know, they thought it was just too much, it's overload, they're not sensitive to kind of what I need, you know, I, it's too much work. And now we're at the exact opposite in the spectrum. We talk to our candidates applying to Harvard. So Harvard's insensitive. They have one essay. I don't have space for what I need, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really interesting sort of hearing the argument, but, but it's tricky. You know, what I would say to you is that you've got to realize that your essays, your letters of recommendation, the non-essay data portion of your resume, those are all sort of tools. Those four pieces of the platform, and the fifth being your interview, if you get it, you've got to sort of figure out, you know, those stories, those leadership characteristics, et cetera, and you've got to sort of allocate those things across the essay. And you're going to have two if you get an interview, right? Um, but, you know, you basically have to be very judicious about sort of what you have your recommender say versus what you write about versus highlighting something a little bit more in your resume versus really going all out and tweaking the uh, non-essay data portion of your resume to make sure you include all the things that you want to include. All these things work in concert. That's why you need to have your story down before you start. You can't just start writing your essay. So again, my essay is done. Now I'm going to move to my resume. Now I'm going to move to the recommendations. You've got to think about this stuff holistically up front. And that's really the point of the slide. Okay, so the essay. I assume all of you can read. I will not read it to you. If you can't read, getting to Harvard is going to be quite difficult, I promise you, right? But basically, what they're saying is they have all the stuff on you, right? They have your transcripts, your extracurriculars, awards, your goals, test scores, et cetera, recommendations. What's missing, right? What else do you have to sort of say about yourself? And people don't like this. Um, I will tell you a couple of things. One, what you choose to write about is not going to make or break getting into school. It's going to, you know, it's what you write about. So there are many people that we've worked with that have written their typical why one MBA, why HB essay. There are other people that have written, you know, essays sort of describing themselves, introducing themselves to their classmates. People have written about, you know, um, growing up in war-torn countries. So, you know, in fact, um, uh, the Admissions Director D. Leopold wrote, uh, I think, a couple, couple weeks, a couple months ago, about how someone last year didn't even write an essay. Right? This is optional. So, so don't freak out about your topic. Okay. But what I'll tell you is that if you've done this, right? If you've gone through and figured out kind of what you want to write about and what your story is, what your narrative, this will be a lot easier. Okay, because from our perspective, the keys to success are really focusing on your brand. So what is it that you've not been able to include already, right? So when you look at your, your transcripts, your extracurriculars, your awards, all stuff will tell a story about you, right? And you're going to have your recommenders focus on a certain things. What's missing? 
what in your brand, what in your leadership characteristics, what in your narrative is not included that you're thinking, oh, if this does not get in, that's going to be a problem, right? That should probably be your topic. Don't lease that information that's, you know, already on your application. One of the worst things <clears throat> that's happened for a lot of people is that there's no word limit on here. And, you know, we've had candidates come to us and say, you know, give me, give me your first draft. And these aren't necessarily package clients. These are candidates that are just doing a single list edit. I've got a draft for 1,500 words. No one wants to, I don't even want to read that. That's my job, okay? Um, don't overdo it. So don't basically restate, you know, information that's on your resume or in the non-essay data portion. Not too much. You have to sort of frame certain things, but you know what I mean. Don't do too much of that. But don't also, you know, write an opus. Nobody wants to read Dostoevsky, War and Peace again, okay? Great book. But leave that to the experts, all right? You do want to address your weaknesses. So, you know, and there are clever ways to do it. So if you have a weak GPA, you don't have to say, this is why my GPA is so weak. You know, you can write about being sort of a standout performer. You can write about being great with data and kind of allude to the fact that you've done that well professionally, but not always well academically. So be a little bit creative and really know when to stop writing. Again, you know, we've gotten essays and people have said, you know, literally, which may sound funny to you, is the essay done? You know, is this essay done? Do you think it's done? Did, is it finished? And I'll say, I don't know, is it finished? You know, you wrote it, right? So you've got to know what is your point. And that, that's, you know, to me what's really interesting is like, you know, the, the fact that there's no structure in this just places so much pressure on candidates to really have their story down. I don't think this advice, which you've been given for years, is any more relevant than it is today. It's never been more relevant than today in terms of like knowing what you want to say, having a strategy. Okay, hope is not a strategy, as you guys all know. So, have something, have a have a goal, have a target. Know what you want to write about. Uh, pick an element in your brand that's not covered elsewhere. Um, you know, make sure if you've got you know obvious uh, weaknesses and you've mitigated them, bring that up here and be concise and stop writing when the time is done. Okay. Um, as I mentioned before, it's not easy if you don't have a plan. Right? There's no structure. And obviously, this is one of those questions, one of those essays where people say, what are other people writing on? You know, we get calls every day where people say, I'm literally calling you because, you know, I'm applying to HBS and I'd love for you to give me, uh, you know, you see a lot of essays from people that are applying to the school, tell me what everyone's writing like, give me a breakdown. Right? So, don't worry about that. You know, the worst thing you can do is write about what your colleague is writing about in your job. You guys have different motivations. Right? So, you really have to have this sort of tie in very important to have sort of an idea of what you want to do. If you do, it's actually quite, it, 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 it's really pleasing to write this because you finally get a chance to write what you want to write and you're not encumbered by word count or a certain kind of question. And, and, and it can be very liberating, to be honest with you. Okay. There are many of you that are applying um, as joint degree applicants. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. You know, in Harvard, yeah, you know, you get JD MBA, MD MBA, MPP MBA, there's so many different kinds of degrees. What I would tell you is that going, getting another degree because you can is not a good reason to, right? So we talk to people quite frequently and say, I want to get a JD MBA. You know, I was top of my class at BYU or some school like that. I've got a really good GMAT. I say, why do you want a JD MBA? Like, what I say to them is, what job or profession is it that you need a JD MBA and why do you need both? And a lot of times I can't answer that question. And that makes me feel like they're going to struggle on this essay. And sometimes they do, right? So you've got to think about why you want it. You've got to really articulate why you think it's important. Now, maybe potentially you want to be an entrepreneur um, and you want to be able to sort of work through contracts and understand business development strategy and not have to outsource your stuff to a, a lawyer and pay high fees and, and be slowed down. That's a good reason. Maybe you want to be general counsel you know, at a, at a major corporation like a Coca-Cola or a firm like that. And you've got to basically, it makes sense to kind of understand business um, and law. Maybe you want to be an elected representative in the U.S. or elsewhere. And, you know, we're now business is really, especially since 2008, you know, business and government sort of operate in, in, in sort of concentric circles, if you will. And so you can make that kind of, but you have to make some kind of argument, right, why it's a good fit for you. You've got to really indicate how your professional experiences have led you to this degree now. That, that's assuming that you are applying after having worked for a while. If you're applying straight from school, you still need to make that argument how your internships and like, your classes are really pushing you towards getting this joint degree. And what I would really caution you to do is, you know, don't overlook your personal experiences. A lot of times people they sort of hear Harvard Business School and they really get caught up in trying to figure out, you know, 
And so you, I can see them mentally putting on their tweeds and their top hats because they think that's kind of who they need to be. And they just sort of really gloss over the personal motivations. And those should really be pretty close to the top. You know, the schools want to know that. They already know you're a good student. They already know you've got a good score. They want to make sure that you're interested in your dynamic, you're, you're passionate. Those are the people that are going to bet on being successful and really bringing glory to the Harvard name. And that's kind of one of the motivations they want. And obviously also contributing to their classmates around them. Okay? Um, think about things that, you know, specific events that have shaped you. So I'll give you an example. So, um, and this is a general piece of advice for you, not necessarily for a joint degree. We had a guy that we worked with who um, lost his father in college, and he had to basically leave University of Virginia and move back to New York to um, really become the man of the house. He had to work part. He ended up working like 25, 30 hours a week. He went to sort of a you know, less prestigious school um, than UVA, and he just changed it. He put his sister through through the Juilliard School, you know, he paid for like literally about 80% of his family's contribution. Um, that's the kind of stuff that shapes your life. And that changed his whole life in terms of responsibility, in terms of like valuing his education, in terms of like, you know, his focus, in terms of like what he wanted to do with his life, um, feeling like, hey, I want to follow something I'm passionate about because I just spent these years doing something I'm not passionate about. So that was a real big motivation. He almost, we almost had to beg him to write about that. I said, this is your application. This is your rest. This is sort of a huge theme. You've got to include this. And I would definitely encourage those of you who have those kinds of stories to really include that stuff. Key events, key, key lessons learned. It's really important that you do that. And make sure, by the way, it is a story you can share with your work colleagues. So we get people sometimes that kind of want to overstep the bounds and share sort of a risque story because uh, I think it's interesting, and I'll be honest, I've got a pretty wild sense of humor, so I find a lot of that stuff funny, but, you know, you can't write about some of it. <laughs> if you can't tell your grandmother this, Jennifer, you'll appreciate this, if you can't tell your grandmother this story, then you shouldn't write about it in your application, okay? Um, so just be aware of that. The HBS interview, so, and then post-interview reflection, those are, it's interesting. So things have changed a little bit. Um, the interview's always been invitation only. Um, and there's always been uh, an ability for uh, candidates to basically do it via Skype if they need to. So those of you in the military that are on here, you know, you're not expected to fly out of your base necessarily and, and go to campus or go to Hub City. I, I do advise if you can do it um, either on campus or in a Hub City, do it. If you can do it on campus, do it. Um, but you're not going to be penalized if you sort of do it on Skype if that's the only, only recourse you have. Okay? It is 30 minutes. Um, and, you know, they're pretty strict about that, okay? So, you you know, don't be offended if you're sort of talking, you feel good about things, you look down your clock and you're on the way out and it's only 34 minutes, right? That's what happens. It's pretty strict. They want to be fair to people, and there's so many people that they want to interview, they just can't keep it super long, right? And realize that they've seen your application. So it's not blind. Some other schools are blind, meaning, you know, all they've seen is your resume. This is not the case. They've seen your material. Um, and so that poses, you know, you've got to think about, okay, how do you balance, do you bring in new stuff or do you emphasize stuff that you've already written? I recommend a mixture of both. So if they're, if they're really um, amazing stories, amazing experiences, either in your letters of recommendation or in your essay uh, that you've written about and you feel like, hey, I need to shape this a little bit, spend some time shaping it. Spend some time giving color and background to it but also use this opportunity to bring in other things. There's no doubt that with one essay, albeit unlimited words, with one essay, there's going to be stuff that you're not able to write about, okay? So make sure you have that figured out, what new topic, what new idea, what new experience you're going to bring to the course of the interview. And definitely address the elephant in the room. So, you know, if you have a weak GPA and you made the interview, don't think that the GPA is not an issue. You just happen to have a lot of good stuff in your application where they gave you a shot, but you do need to talk about it, right? And that also applies to if you've, if you've you know, you're in your fourth job in, in five years, if your, your, your GMAT is challenging, you do need to speak about those things, okay? You do need to speak about lessons learned, you do need to speak about, um, you know, how that's not, or, you know, how you're great professionally, you do need to speak about how, if you have a weak GPA, you know, you're going to, you know, form study groups and, and basically you're going to study ahead of time and, and sort of maybe take an introductory course in, uh, in accounting 
prior to school if you're accepted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So don't assume you can just avoid those things because you made the interview. It's just not the case. The other thing I want to tell you is that the interview is your last piece of submitted information, but it's not the last piece of the interview, the last piece of your application. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, um, uh, you know, a lot of times people go into the interview and they just kill the interview. I believe in when I tell them, yeah, I killed in the interview. It was amazing. Uh, and sometimes they don't get in. And they don't understand it. Say, maybe the interview wasn't as good as I thought. And I say, no, the interview could have been as good as you thought, but maybe there were other things in your applications that we didn't see them theoretically. Maybe there are other things in there that, you know, were not super strong. So realize that it's your last submitted point, but it's just a piece of the file. So they're still reviewing your application, et cetera. So don't think that, man, if I kill them in my interview, I'm definitely going to make it. <laughs> but I will tell you that if you don't do on your interview and you feel like I got killed in my interview, you probably are not going to make it, right? But don't think if you just dominate your interview on a great interview and you don't get in, you, can't, you think, don't let that shake your confidence in the quality of your interview skills, especially if you're looking to re, uh, reapply in, in the preceding year, right? And the post-interview reflection, I said, we don't really know what it's going to be yet. Uh, we'll see what happens. But last year, basically, it's really interesting. It's basically like, okay, so we interviewed you. Do, do we get to know you well, right? Uh, how well do we get to know you? So, you know, we'll help you with that. Um, but it's it's really a good chance for you to come back and just say, hey, I didn't get a chance to include these things. It's cleanup. Don't regurgitate what you wrote or what you wrote and or what you said. Really use it. And I, I would hope that most of you probably have more to talk about uh, yourself in terms of your accomplishments in the 30 minutes. So don't respond and say, no, you got everything, right? Like, really think it's okay. What did I not cover? Now, what this means is that when you get out of your interview, you should be jotting notes down. Okay, things I didn't cover, things I wanted to say, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You should be doing all of that um, so that you can look back at it and say, okay, what is not, what did I not cover? Here are the things you meant. You know, you don't want to be foggy on that. And the last thing I'll say about the interview, um, which I failed to mention, is you need to go on questions, right? So when an interview asks you if you have questions, I used to interview for Harvard, I used to interview for Wharton, I'd say, okay, do you have any questions? People didn't have any questions really kind of annoyed the heck out of me. And I felt, this person's really not interested in my school. Um, you need to have questions, right? So I loved when people would take out a, a sheet of paper with typewritten questions. Okay, well, we covered these three or four questions. You know, I've got these two other questions. It's okay to have that, and it's really necessary to have some questions heading into the interview, right? Um, recommendations, you need two recommendations for Harvard. It used to be three. Now it's two, okay? And the recommendations are robust. So just to let you know, uh, the good news for you is that a lot of these schools, Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, et cetera, they now have common questions, which is great. A lot of us have been pushing for that. Um, a lot of us in AGAC, um, which is Association Independent Graduate Admissions Consultants, have been pushing these schools to do that. I don't know if they listened to us, but they thought it was a good idea. And so they've got common interview questions, which is great, right? That means that, you know, you don't have to ask a recommender to write, you know, 10 different essay questions, 10 different interview responses, or recommendation responses for 10 different schools. Um, but it is robust, right? And so give them enough time. You know, they do want to know about sort of how the interviewer, how the recommender has interacted with you. So a, a you know, a family friend who went to Harvard Business School but that has, has had no supervisor experience is not going to be a good person because they're going to ask them, how do you know this person? Describe the nature of your interaction. They can't be like, well, I knew Sally growing up when she was five and now she's a dynamic 25 year old who works, you know, running her own company. That's not a good interaction. So it's probably going to be someone that's supervising either professionally and or in a nonprofit. They will ask about, you know, that person's role in the organization. That is also mean that you need to get a CEO of the company to write that recommendation. It does mean that, you know, you want someone that has seniority over you and you know, I, I would put that first, and if they have seniority in the company, that's also positive too, right? Because can, their perspective is a little bit more nuanced and developed than someone who's sort of very junior. But the most important thing is they've got a good relationship with you. They've seen the context of your work, and they can speak about how you compare to other people, your peers. And that's very important, comparative performance. They do, there will be some question, a question about how you respond to feedback. Uh, what's your response to that, right? So. Um, I know most of you are used to winning. Uh, most of you are used to being very successful. Most of you still have gotten some kind of feedback saying you can be better. And you know, if you haven't, 
it can be a challenge. You got to sort of work way through that. But I would challenge you to sort of think about it a little bit more because that's important. They want to know, they want to know your ability to sort of you know be humbled on and work on weaknesses to get better. That's very very important because that's going to happen in business school. Okay, so make sure that you have prepared recommenders for that. And if if they don't know, tell them like, hey, do you remember the time that you know my first performance review, my first you know. Um, uh, three months, six months after I started working here, you know, I was told I need to improve my communication skills, right? And so hopefully I've done better. Like, let them know. You've got to prepare them, okay? And then there just, there's a place for additional statements, right? So use a corner recent supervisor. Um, you know, I'll, some of you ask, hey, should I, can I use a professor? Not unless you are not working or still in school, right? So professors, you know, if you're in a startup and you started a company, and you have a professor from college as an advisor, you can use that person. But if you're sort of three to five years out, it doesn't matter that you know Professor Shrank um, at Michigan loves you. That's too far back. It's got to be sort of relevant for right now. All right? Deadlines. HBS keeps pushing it earlier and early, earlier. Round one is coming up. Wow, it's next month. Um, it's pretty amazing, actually. It's almost based about a month away. You will fan out early. Um, I would not rush round one over round two. Um, I wouldn't rush. I would get it in if you can. Uh, there's typically more free money available in round one. They're typically, um, uh, you know, allows you also to be part of the network earlier. So this allows you to sort of network with other accepted students, network with current students, network with alumni. Obviously, pursue pre-business school internships. Take the vacation you always want to take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it definitely gives you an advantage um, in that sense. But in terms of getting in. It's not really a huge deal. Round two, round three, big deal, big difference. So you do want to rush for round two. You don't want to apply round three, right? But basically, apply round one. You'll find out in December of this year. Round two is in early January of next year. You'll find out in March. Round three is in um, early April. You'll find out in May. Um, round three is tricky. You know, by then, all the grant money is gone. There are questions about sort of how badly you want to go to the school, how prepared you are. Housing could be a little bit of an issue. Um, you know, you haven't met your classmates quite as much. You have to have a good reason for applying around three to a school like Harvard, all right? Two plus two. For those of you that are in college and during your senior year or in grad school, the two plus two program is a program where um, you apply while you're in school, you get accepted, it's deferred admissions. You'll work for two years, you come back for two years. That's why it's two plus two, okay? So very similar deadlines as well. Um, again, you can be in grad school and still be eligible, right? The really important thing for the two plus two people is knowing that you know your academics and test scores and activities on campus are really magnified in a way that doesn't exist for people to work for. You don't have that buffer. So you know the people we've worked with who've been successful in the two plus two, I mean, people historically have had really good grades, um, really good grades, right? Now we've had some people that haven't had great grades, but you know you don't get those flyers. You don't get the person that's got a three three and a seven hundred who gets in, or you know, or even below that. That's that's not going to happen for the most part on the two plus two. Okay, it could happen on the full time, um, you know, regular because those people may have dominated professionally. But two plus two is really it's almost like applying to law school or med school where it's so driven on your grades and your test scores. All right, so you need to be active on campus as well. That's very important. So the people you see. T plus two, often editors of school newspaper, captain of sort of the soccer team, you know, those kinds of type, you know, leader of sort of a, a student lab, um, you know, the the sort of that kind of leader um, on campus is typically rewarded with a T plus two acceptance, right? Internships are very important. Internships end up taking on the importance of sort of full-time jobs. Those of you that have worked for a while, your internships don't mean a darn thing, really, in terms of applying, okay? Um, and obviously, you need recommenders. Your recommenders will be your professors, clearly. Okay. I want to make sure we get to questions. I'm going to just do. Um, actually, not really going to go into this. this. Is being taped, but essentially, you know, we had sort of a person. This is these are real people we've worked with, and some of these are up on our site as well. But basically, uh, someone who's done is in their fourth year of marketing at a fairly large brand pharma, pharma company. They had been given a division. Um, that was really sort of old and dying, um, and they were sort of said, you know, make something of it, okay? Like partner, sell it, figure it out. And they basically, the opportunity for them, which they took advantage of, was sort of finding a brand that they could sort of use for a different purpose. 
um, market to younger people. Um, they sort of added sunscreen and sort of a new delivery. It's actually very fascinating. Um, and then they, they clearly, you know, dominate in terms of increasing sales, and this is something they got an award and promotion for. So this is a kind of story that's very effective in terms of getting into school, right, because it shows entrepreneurship, shows being creative. They had, by the way, volunteered for this. Um, they didn't know it was going to be as bad <laughs> as it was, but, but they had volunteered for that. And um, they also had some international opportunities in terms of doing cross-border communication and going to travel in that place. All right. Um, We've got lots of ways to work with you. I don't want to deep dive too much into that, but people always ask. We get a million emails after all these. So what I'll say to you is that this, that you know, we try to develop um, opportunities to work with you, to work with us, whether you have sort of 250 bucks or a couple thousand dollars. So there's something there for you, um, and it's high value. Okay? So we've got hourly, one hour minimum. You're building 15 minute increments thereafter. Uh, we've got a final review package, which is where you write the entire application. Give it to us. We do one round of edits on your essays, resume. We'll look at your letters of recommendation if you can get your hands on them. Uh, give you a mock interview and a write-up. Then we've got a streamlined package where it's just sort of essays, outlining, brainstorming, only essays, couple couple rounds of editing. Then we've got sort of the big granddaddy Cadillac, the comprehensive, which is actually quite popular. So there are lots of ways to work with us um, if you're interested in working with us. And we also have spaced out payments. So, you know, one of the things we challenge ourselves in this year is like trying to find a way. Anyone that wants to work with us, we want to be able to work with us. I'm working on some new cool things in terms of trying to make sure that's even more possible. But reach out to us if you want to do something. Reach out to us. We'll try to figure out how to make it work. Okay. Uh, we've got a ding analysis. You applied last year, the year before, it did not go well. Reach out to us. We'll look at your application, setting the right foot. And in fact, we'll give you $250, half of it towards another sort of offering that we're doing. We've got a pre-application package. Those of you that are, you know, a year, six months, you're not applying this year, you're applying next year or beyond, but you want to know what you can do to get yourself ready, the pre-application package is for you. And again, you will get a credit um, as well. So all this stuff is on our site. Um, take a look and or reach out to me. Um, we're having a B, uh, B2G chat party after we answer probably 10 to 12 minutes of questions. Um, we are going to sort of uh, be doing a review of the program. Um, on our blog, which we're fixing, actually. If you want a free consultation and you've not had one, go to flexbooker.com slash admitadvantage. Um, my name is Kofi Kankim. I'm at kcankim at admitadvantage.com. And we also are giving a 10% discount. We've extended it. It's going to be through August, but it's actually through September. Um, 3374, that'll be 10% for all our b 2 map people. So with that, uh, let's get busy with some questions. Okay. All right, so question. If 41% um, of the class are women, does that mean that 41% of the applicants are women as well? If not, do you think that there are more or less women applying than that percentage? That's an interesting question. I really don't have that number, um, but I would guess that I would guess that less than 41% of the applicants are women. Um, you know, HBS, as with all other business schools, are making effort to recruit women. Um, you know, because companies are saying we need more women because if you look at who's buying products, often in families, it's uh, the women that are sort of dominating the decision making. So it's probably a little bit higher than that, to be honest with you. It's not, I'm sorry, it's probably a little bit less than that. It's not higher. It's probably fewer women and they're probably getting in a slightly higher acceptance rate than the men. All right, let me undock this because it's hard to read. Okay. Hi, Kofi. The HPS essay this year is optional. Do we even have to write it? No, you do not. Uh, but I would suggest you do write it. So there will be a couple of people that don't get in, or that do get in this year, and haven't written, uh, you know, a response to the essay. But that's going to be far and few in between. And it's very kind of arrogant to think that everything else you have is so stellar that you don't need to write um, write an essay. So you, I plan on writing it. Not not a good idea to skip it. Okay. Question: What if I haven't had a massive life changing experience that shaped my life? Okay, that's okay. I didn't either, right? Uh, now, granted, I went to Wharton and Harvard College, but but so what? Still, it's okay. Um, it's okay if you haven't had. Most people have not had that. They haven't, you know, rescued a baby on Mount Kilimanjaro that was left for dead. They haven't done that kind of stuff. You just need to write about kind of what your motivation is for going to school, and that'll be fine. Most of the people on campus are regular. They've you know, had regular, normal lives. A little bit of 
a little bit of hardship, but not dramatic hardship. Okay, so that's that's totally okay. What is the ideal work experience to get in the HBS? Um, so I, I I don't you know it's funny I thought I kind of covered that, but um, in terms of duration, it's probably at least three. I'd say three to five years. In terms of type of work experience, it really runs a gamut. But I'll say that it's work experience that is punctuated by excellence. So it's work experience where your recommender is saying that you are amongst the top 10 to 15 percent, if not higher, of your peer group. It's 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 experience where you've been promoted, got increased responsibility, you've managed sort of tasks and or people, and you generally are seen as like having left an imprint and a legacy in your job um, and made the organization better uh, for you being there than if you hadn't been there. That, that's kind of the consistent theme. Now that can happen, you know, athletically, it can happen in the military, it can happen in banking, it can happen in nonprofit, I mean, it can happen in a lot of different places, but you're not going to see people the people that get in the HBS are not people that are treading water in their jobs. They've made their jobs into a career. And they're making a serious impact. And I promise you, to the point where when their recommender is asked to write the recommendation, they almost wish they didn't have to write it because they want that person there because they're going to be hard to replace. Okay? Okay, question. Would my age, 32, be viewed as a major draw pack? Would it be a good idea to address this in the essay? That's an interesting question, and we get that all the time. I would tell you that the answer is no. And the reason we say that is it's not necessarily the age per se. It's a question of, you know, HBS, like most schools, they don't want to feel like you're just going to business school to reset, right? Because things aren't going well in your career. Everyone wants to bet on a winning horse. And so there's always this concern if you're kind of eight years out of graduation, you haven't gone back to school, why are you going? Do you really need it? Are you going to fit in with the culture? You know, um, are you just sort of trying to like sort of do a restart? Um, you know, there's concern about are certain jobs going to be unfriendly to you, so you're going to have limited opportunities. So those are things you need to tangle with. It's not those are you know being 32 is more of a it it, it it's a correlated fact. It's 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 a correlation. It's not necessarily the, the the driving force, but you need to address those other issues. You need to highlight the fact that look. You know, I am bringing so much more to the table. I'm bringing a lot. I've got eight years of experience and contacts and, and sort of leadership, and I'm able to sort of leverage that with my classmates. And by the way, I also think my 26, 27, 20-year-old classmate has a lot to offer and teach me, and I'm not just going to come there and sort of be the big brother or big sister and kind of be Mr. and Mrs. Know-it-all. So it's really important to give those signals. Okay. Okay. We have so many questions. Hold on. Okay. Do you know how many of the schools have gone to the common recommendation form? Has Harvard switched to the common recommendation form? Harvard has switched to the common recommendation form. There are a number of schools that have done it. I think it's probably about seven. It's seven or eight. It's when I was at a talk at um, Columbia a couple of uh, a couple of uh, months ago, and they were talking about about how all these schools have done. It. It's a lot of schools. I mean, it's it's basically all. Uh, a lot of the top tiers, so they don't have the full list, but it's like Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, Chicago, Kellogg, Columbia. It's a lot of schools. So, and I suspect it's a kind of it's it's the, it's the type of school um, where a lot of other schools are for, sort of follow suit because they want to be sort of in that in that category associated as such. Okay. Question: How can I make a great use of being able to speak multiple languages for coming from an HBCU. Am I at a disadvantage of graduating from a small school? HBCU is historically a black college university. Um, the fact you speak multiple languages is great. The fact you come from an HBCU is, is kind of somewhat immaterial. Um, um, look, you will find a disproportionate number of, of Harvard um, first years coming from Ivy League type schools. And that's the case across all the schools, right? So my first year class of one, there were 48 of us from Harvard at our class of 820, which is a lot, right? But you'll still find that the vast majority of people did not come from those schools, right? I'm including the Dukes of the world and the Stanfords, et cetera. <clears throat> In fact, what's interesting is that Spelman and Morehouse and Howard, which are HBCUs, are actually huge feeders of African American students into Harvard Business School. So if you come from one of those schools, you're in great shape. Otherwise, look, you just, you know, you're at a disadvantage if you didn't do well, 
they're, you know, if you didn't do well academically, you're at a disadvantage. But if you did well, um, you know, I wouldn't worry about it at all. It's nothing you can control, so don't worry about it. The fact you speak four languages is good. You need to indicate how that's going to impact your classmates and or how you're going to leverage that in your career, right? Being able to speak four languages is great, but if you're just like, I speak four languages, it's your job to connect the dots. What does that mean? So you're going to be sort of a translator of sorts in class. Have you traveled internationally? Is that going to make sense for your career? So they should feel more comfortably going to find that job, that dream job, and be very successful. You've got to, you've got to, uh, you know, sort of make it relevant. Okay. Okay. Question: If I am to apply in round one, <clears throat> what is the latest I should take the GMAT? Are self-reported GMAT scores sufficient, or do they have an official score sent before the application deadline? Usually self-sufficient, uh, self-reporting is sufficient as long as you can get a score in within, say, two to three weeks after the deadline. Um, I mean, the latest you should take it, it really depends on how much time you think you need to, to take your, to work on your application. If you're going to work on your application first or simultaneously, I probably would say I'll take it, you know, no later than probably the last week of this month. Um, if you haven't worked on your application, you'd probably give yourself at least two, two and a half weeks to work on your application. Okay. <clears throat> Main difference in application focus versus Stanford or MIT Sloan. Well, okay. Are you saying how Harvard differs from Stanford or MIT Sloan? To be honest, I kind of think a lot of these schools are fairly similar. I will say that you know Stanford. Stanford is probably more interested in your your desire to be part of that culture in a way that sort of Dartmouth is as well. It's obviously smaller. Um, I don't necessarily know there's, in, in, you know, people think that everyone that goes to majors in entrepreneurship and everyone starts companies. It's really not the case. There is obviously more of a bent towards entrepreneurship. There's more of a bent towards technology. Um, those things should be part of your lexicon. But I wouldn't say necessarily you have to go into the MIT is, is certainly a little bit more oriented towards technology. But it, to be honest with you, if you look at like where people work, um, when they're done, there isn't that huge a difference. Now, if you want to do venture capital, Stanford makes a lot of sense, right? Because you're sort of in, or Berkeley for that matter, because it's in Silicon Valley's backyard. But I, I wouldn't say like, you know, Stanford people are fundamentally super different than, than Harvard people. Um, MIT people, it's a little bit more quantitative based, a little bit more, more technical. You will find a little bit more of an engineering base there, people that want to incorporate technology into their careers, then you'll find it like at Harvard. You'll find some of those same people at Stanford though. Okay. I'm currently unemployed. Is it better to apply when I'm employed as business schools like winners? Quote unquote. That's my quote. Um depends how long you've been unemployed, to be honest with you. Um, it is better to apply when you're when employed, but the that's not the question. The question you're asking me really is is, you know, should you get another job and then apply next year? What I would tell you is that if you get another job now and then you apply a year later, business schools will be a little bit concerned about that in terms of your loyalty to the company. Are, and you should be concerned, are you going get to get a good recommendation? Um, my perspective is that if you get a new job, you should plan to work there for two years before you apply. So you effectively apply in fall 2016, starting fall 2017. If you've been unemployed, I think, for, let's call it, three months or less, um, I think you can launch, and, and let's say you'd worked for a while. So it also depends on how long you, you've been working. If you work for four years, you've been unemployed for three months, four months, that's a lot different than working for two years and being unemployed for three, four months. So it's a little bit of a nuanced question, but I would tell you generally, if you've been unemployed for three to four months, three months or less, I probably would make a push and apply this year. As long as you've got enough work experience, you've got at least two, three years of experience. Otherwise, I probably would, would try to get a job, and I'd probably look to apply in 20, 2016. All right, I'm a Hispanic prospective applicant. I try not to play into the minority card as I feel it hasn't been that much of a hindrance. So I still try to capitalize on this ask them application given Harvard's support for Hispanic applicants? That's an interesting question. I would say if you can show how being Hispanic, hopefully Spanish speaking is relevant, you should leverage it. Um, but you shouldn't say I'm Hispanic, therefore I am, let me in. Um, that's your job to say why is it relevant. And I can think of a million reasons, you know, the, the growth in the Hispanic population here, the Hispanic purchasing power, uh, the growth, you know, uh, you've got uh, you know, the growth of sort of Latin American economies if you, if you do speak Spanish. Um, 
but you're right in the sense that I wouldn't overemphasize that. Frankly, you're going to check that box anyway, and they're going to know you're Hispanic. So if you don't want to write about it at all, they'll still know you're Hispanic, and they can take whatever factor they want into account. Does getting a recognition from a Harvard graduate help? Yes, it does if that person knows you well. Um, uh, and they supervise you, but if it's just kind of a random Harvard person, um, it's not going to help that much. And you probably, if anything, you'd want them writing like a supplemental recognition. It's just like an email they'd shoot over to Harvard Business School. You wouldn't want them taking one of your real recognitions. Okay. I think that's the last question. Um, let us um, break. Uh, so let's jump online and go to the chat party. Um, uh, Eric is going to be there. I will be there. And let's uh, go from there. And again, if you want a free consultation, sign up. Email me if you've got a super personal question you can't ask. But I'm going to head over to the um, Beat the GMAT um, MBA Watch on the Harvard Business School page. I think that's the right one. And I'll see you guys there in probably about two minutes. All right. So thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. I hope this is helpful. All right. Bye.